talking. I would appreciate it. Uh, my name is Kate Ali and I am hosting the Lane Arts Council Art Walk tonight uh, and I am extremely excited to be here um, looking at the work of Morris Graves tonight. Um, before I get into that I want to quickly thank our sponsor uh, Pacific University College of Education uh, for uh, sponsoring us tonight and please visit their open house tonight at 40 East Broadway Suite 250. So, um, when I saw the lineup of galleries uh, and I saw that we were able um, to have Morris Graves work in Eugene, Oregon, um, I was very excited for a number of reasons. Um, as an artist, uh, I've been inspired by his work before. The fact that he's so deeply moved by nature um, has so much sort of symbolism and spirituality um, embedded in his work um, has been incredibly inspiring for both artists and critics uh, over the years. Um, he is a uh, Oregon native uh, and there is so much to say about him but lucky for you we have a lot so of experts here to talk about that. Really the first so, time that his work has been made available in Oregon. He has a um, representation in New York uh, in um, Sea uh, New York, the Schmidt Bingham uh, gallery in Woodside Brassage in um, Seattle, but nothing here in Oregon. So that's a real unique opportunity for us um, to have access to this work. Uh, we can see it, right, at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum, but the fact that it's for purchase here is, is, is very exciting for the city of Eugene. So um, now I would like to hand this microphone over to Dick Easley so he can introduce both the work and the um, number of people here who are experts on Morris Graves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. And thank all of you for joining us this, this evening for uh, what we consider really an exciting opening. As Kate has mentioned, this is a, a first for Oregon uh, and certainly a first for White Lotus Gallery. Uh, we are excited and proud to, uh, to be cooperating with the Morris Graves Foundation in order to bring this work uh, and offer it uh, in the marketplace. Now, uh, rather than, than Dick Easley try to explain Morris Graves' work, I, uh, I would like to call upon uh, people who know a lot more about it than I do. Uh, primary among that, uh, that, that group of experts is uh, Robert Yarber and his wife, Desiree Yarber. Robert met Morris Graves in 1973. He became his assistant and companion until Morris's death in 2001. If there's anybody that knows Morris Graves, it's Robert Yarber. Robert became heir to the Graves estate and unselfish, unselfishly uh, turned the, the property and the inheritance over to the Morris Graves Foundation. He works assiduously to keep this sacred land uh, viable the Morris Graves Foundation runs uh, workshops for, for artists uh, uh, about nine months a year at, at the property, which is located in Lolita, California, just uh, south of Eureka. Uh, it, it's a magical place. But uh, they, they need money to run the foundation, and they're liquidating uh, the, uh, the, the Graves art in order to raise that money. You can be a part of that. Uh, w without uh, without boring further, I'd like to introduce Robert Yarber and Desiree, 
who, uh, who will uh, answer questions uh, and make some comments. I also would like to mention that there is a remarkable book of Morris Graves' selected letters, which was uh, co-edited by uh, Larry Fong and Vicki Halper. The book is available for sale. Larry is, is autographing the books. And I would say that after all the study that I put into uh, to Morris Graves and his work, I only be began to do the man when I read uh, Larry and Vicky's selected letters. The archives, by the way, are in the possession of the, of the Knight Library. Uh, Robert was uh, kind enough to, uh, to uh, donate those, uh, that, the, the archival material to the University of Oregon. Robert, carry on. Okay. Thank you, Dick, and thank you, HP. It's so grand to be here in Eugene and to see all these incredible people. Um, Morris, and here's my wife also, <laughs> Desiree. <laughs> and uh, here we are, we've come out of the woods into civilization now to uh, say a few words to you. And uh, one thing I want to tell you about Morris is that he said, he said, my first interest is in being, and along the way I'm a painter. So remember that our life, what we do with it, is even more important than even the paintings or the sculpture, whatever we do, that's just a kind of a byproduct. And how we live our life is the most important thing. And I know from Morris's life, one of the first things that was so important with him <clears throat> was taking care of the earth. And I think, I think that's the job of the artist of the 21st century, is, is to care for the earth and to heal it. And we need to do that because you know what we've done to it. <laughs> we've done some beautiful things, but we've also made a mess. And I just want to let you know that we live on a piece of property that is a prim primordial forest. It has never been logged. Mm -hmm. And it's very special because when you walk it, it's like you're walking from the beginning of time. And it's incredibly special. And I would like all of you to have that experience too because it's, it just transforms your life. And whatever you do then after that, it just flows out from the clothes you wear, the food you eat, the homes that you make. So. Do any of you have questions for Robert about Morris Graves or any of the work that's, uh, that's displayed here at the gallery? I think this is the best speech I ever heard. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think this speech, inspires many people here in this room. It will transform a lot of people's lives. Thank you for coming out of the okay. woods. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, thank you. I don't know really where to start. I mean, Morris lived 90 years, so how can I put his life 90 years into 60 seconds and give it any justice? But if he was here, you would look at you all and say so you're all artists, you're all divine, and just be it, and live your highest, highest nature. Just do it, even if it meant sacrificing everything that you did, because war certainly did that. <laughs> Is there any questions? Because we certainly want to segue into Larry and, and Vicky, because the book that's come out on Morris's life is incredible. I, I wrote to Vicky and I said, this is, organized, solidified truth. <laughs> and when I read it, I either cry some places, I weep, other places I'm shocked at what Morris did, because he didn't tell me everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, only, I only lived with him from uh, the age, well, he was 63 and I was 22. 
and we were on similar paths. I just dropped out of college for because of Vietnam, and anyway, so I, I don't think I could have taken Morris when he was early, well, younger. So I, I'm glad I got him when he was 63 to 90. Okay. There's, she has a question. Oh, I have a question. Um, how Here. did you make, make such an instant connection? Because I understand you met when you were really? hitchhiking. You? you were hitchhiking. Can you repeat your and question? And he picked you up. Can you repeat your question? Uh, I just wonder how you made such an instant connection because I understand that you met him when you were hitchhiking and he picked you up. Right. Yeah. And how oh. he knew instantly that there was something that that you became friends and then later developed into it. Okay. She asked how. What kind of chemistry, how did we, when Morris picked me up hitchhiking, how did we instantly know that we were destined to be together for the rest of our life? <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody's fallen and uh, been in love, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know what it's like then when you look into somebody's mm -hmm. eyes. Except I knew immediately. And I remember when I met him and I just knew and then he took me up to the lake and I remember I took off all my clothes and jumped in the lake, <laughs> and it, and I stayed with him to the very end, and it was a beautiful death. Did he um, travel to Jap Japan? Uh, she asked, "Did he travel to Japan?" Yeah. Is yes, he did. He got expelled from high school, and the next day got a job on the on the uh, dollar steamship line and was headed for Japan. So he was there in 1927. No cars. And when he arrived, it was in the spring, and there was, on the thatched huts of the, of the people's homes, there was irises in full bloom on the ridges. And he said, this is the way to live. <laughs> She asked, what was Morris's relationship to Buddhism? Well, it wasn't as heavy as what the critics say. He didn't, Morris was not a practicing Buddhist. He wasn't a practicing Zen. Morris said he was more involved with contemplation instead of the regular orthodox uh, practice. So he said from, from Buddhism, he learned that all is in the mind. And from Shinto, and, and he learned that all is alive. And from Vedanta, he realized that within the illusion is the real. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. But he, he admired Buddhism, but he practiced in his own way. He was his own religion. And he would say that to everybody that you're your own religion. Don't get caught in organized religion. Be your own religion. Okay. Any other questions? It's just getting good. <laughs> well, great. We'll be here in the gallery, so please come up and ask us questions, especially about the art. Robert loves to talk about Morse's paintings and drawings, and he can give you some real insight if you'd like to hear that. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all. So here we have Vicki Hopper and um, Lawrence Baum, right? Uh, here you go. Uh, just to follow up on what Robert Desiree has already shared with you in terms of the complexity of, of what he learned from the livelihood he shared with Morris Graves, especially Robert, was how much give and take there is in, in anyone's life and when it relates to art, you know, the struggles to create, the struggles to really be satisfied with, with all your effort and whether or not it's from day to day or in a larger larger sort of evolution as, as a painter and wanting to be contemporaneous but also wanting to be true to your own ideas and concepts of spirit as to why it is you paint. And so when we were able to have access to not his paintings but to his, his, his own words, to what he was sharing with his family and friends and colleagues and other artists, we found this was an extraordinary opportunity to present an artist that many of us only know by his paintings in a way that is not common. And for us, it was a rare opportunity 
um, having known Gray's, having looked at his art and presented his art, uh, to be able to actually get to his personal papers and see what the minute was, see what the mundane um, life was for someone that you know we only know from the high points, and uh, and their you know life was not all of high points, and um, that's what we're able to glean from this selected uh, cache of, of personal letters. So the letters aren't just about Morris's art. We thought when we started that we were going to find a huge amount about art, and instead we found a lot about his family, about his gallery, about his money troubles, about how he tried to balance his life as an artist with his life as a human being, a lover, a friend, someone who wanted both solitude and craved adulation and company. So the letters are a whole life, some of which is admirable and some of which is not admirable, um, but is very complex and fascinating. And what, you, what we came out with, I think, is an appreciation and understanding of a full life, not of a myth, not of a mythological figure, not of a mythological mystic, but someone um, who had to deal with day-to-day -day things as well as the more elevated act of creation, which is also in the book. So um, it was a great journey for us, and uh, we'd love to have you come along on it. Thank you. So they do have books here for sale, um, and this is also an opportunity to have them signed by the co-editors, so please take advantage of that. Um, we are going to be heading out here in just a couple of minutes and heading over to Out on a Limb. Um, so if you have a chance, please come and join us. Thank you.
in Scotland. This is the next step in the art walk. We're at White Lotus Gallery, um, one of my favorite places. Wonderful works, also works of jewelry. Um, the back room's a, a treasure because different artists, different things, fascinating work. And featured artist here is um, one of my favorites. I finally got to meet him. John Cruzen, who has, uh, certainly has a remarkable pedigree in, in the art world and has done some truly remarkable work based on um, some sketches that he took in the eastern part of the state and at a residency at Playa. So he can uh, fill us in on the where and the why and even explain his texture and he'll tell us about his medium right away. So John, it's a pleasure to see this show. So give him a hand, let's learn something. Oh, you know, you saw it, not required, good. If you can't hear me holler though. I had a residency in Playa in 2011 and Playa is over in southeastern Oregon. If you were over into Bend and you go south from there, there just take a step back. It's better light for her. Oh, Thank light. you. There we okay. Go. Um, and the residency lasted a month, and there were six other artists there at, the, at, at Playa, and all we had to do was work. Everything was supp supplied, meaning our studio, our food, our housing. All we had to do was bring our own equipment and work. Um, I chose over at Playa to, it's on Summer Lake, by the way. Its elevation is 4,000 feet. Uh, right across the back of Playa is Winter Ridge, which is 7,200 feet, so you have some elevation there if you wanted to go up and down. Um, basically, what I finally ended up doing was doing a lot of sketches. And from these sketches, I chose the edge of the lake on Playa. It's Summer Lake, and I covered the wall one wall in the studio with all these sketches, and then I started painting from the sketches. Then when I came back to Eugene in my studio here, I continued working from these sketches. And so basically it's the edge of the lake, uh, the medium is all, all of these are all on board because it was easy to carry over there rather than large canvases. Uh, it's all acrylic. Um, so the medium is acrylic on board, and there's no media in it, I use just water for those who are uh, acquainted with different materials, you can add other things, but I just use water. And that's basically how this series evolved. And what I find remarkable with acrylic, that you get this sense of texture that with the color pops out. I would have thought from back of the room, it's, it's oil with, you know, with other material. Instead, you're, it's quite dynamic. No, it's, it's just all acrylic. Yeah. And also, too, one of the reasons I used acrylic is, is all you have to do is water. You don't have to take all the solvents, and it was easier for me to work with. Also, one of the things that happens with acrylic on board, it slides easier than on canvas. So you don't have that resistance when you're working. So that's a technical thing more than anything else. So basically, I did chose the edge of the lake. Uh, when you get over there, the horizon is expansive. It's basically out at uh, the head of the Great Basin. Um, there's not a lot of foliage. Some of it's ranch land around the lake. Um, it's basically a dry lake as, uh, over a certain period of time of the year. Um, and there's just an awful lot of subject matter. So that. I had to focus on one thing and I just chose the, the ecotone, it's the edge. Some of them reflective, some of them are called ecotone, it's basically where two environments merge. So you have two ecologies happening. It's fascinating, on a, on a couple of them we get the sense of the curvature of the earth um, because of that distance is, uh, we don't get that round here, you know, too many trees, in a way, but uh, <laughs> so that's an interesting notion there. That, uh, that sense of distance. Are there any questions? We like questions. It's easier to answer questions. Yes, Dick. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Dick Easley. Uh, uh, kind of the factotum here at, uh, at White Lotus Gallery. I do what H.P. Lynn tells me to do. Uh, 
But one of the things I found interesting in one of John's earlier presentations is that instead of starting off with a, with a whiteboard, John started off with a blackboard. And I think that creates something that I haven't seen in John's work in years, and that is a sense of light that, that emanates from, from many of these pieces in a very dramatic fashion. And I, I think that it's, it's sort of a, 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 an interesting technique and, and certainly a, a, a welcome facet to, to this new work. What Dick's talking about is usually when a painter works on a ground that's a colored ground, it's usually usually white. It's a gesso ground. Um, in my case, I used a black gesso ground. I noticed in Mexico when I'm down there, a lot of the artists will use a red ground. Mm -hmm. In other words, they'll paint the background all red. And uh, if you go back in art history, uh, Bonnard and Vallard used a color that was very similar to cardboard. And there's something that happens when you lay a paint down against that color. It changes things. The only dis disadvantage, though, is that with some of the colors in acrylic, they're translucent or sem semi-transparent. And so you don't have that glow where the light goes through and hits a white background. On the black, it's, it's different that way. Other questions? Uh, John? Yes, Tara. How do you uh, think of the color after you uh Turn your sketch back into the uh, studio. Well, some of the some of the sketches have uh, notations. They'll have H uh, H I Y, which means high intensity yellow. Uh, and so some of them are coded. After a number of years of painting, you just when you're looking at something over a period of time, I just sort of automatically register what colors I'm going to use with that sketch or those sketches. And so uh, sometimes there are notations on my sketches. My sketches are all in black and white. I use a Sharpie. And they're about oh, maybe a minute, two minute sketches, and that's it. So I just want to get the impression of what I'm seeing. So it's almost like a gesture sketch. So to get to some of these places, it looks like an aerobic experience because you're elevated for a number of these. Um, well, are you gasping? I mean, uh, how did you uh, find some of these yeah. places? In other well, Winter Ridge, which is right behind the, the residency is seven, 7,200 feet. And so you can hike up on that, or you can really, if you want to go up, you drive up to the top and you look down because you're going from a 4,000 elevation to a 7,000 elevation. Or else, in back of the, uh, uh, the compound, I, I just hike up on the hill. So, and sometimes I drove up on certain roads and looked down. Yeah. So it changed the elevation. Besides, I like to tilt the elevation anyway, sometimes unnaturally so. The piece just behind you is a this pretty is, good example. Yeah, this is, a, this is a pretty good, yeah. Yeah, nice.
Thank you.